All right, good morning, everyone. This is the Monday, January 11th, RTD Accountability Full Committee meeting. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. We're having a few technical difficulties, so not everyone is here with us, but we will uh, add them as they join us. Um, I want to acknowledge that it's been a rocky start to 2021, and um, I think Daya had a very nice intro to her subcommittee meeting where she just recognized that there's some pretty um, intense events happening in the world in addition to the pandemic, but including in our nation's capital and just want to recognize that people may be a little bit distracted and preoccupied with that and we understand and I think uh, um, I certainly am as well. But with that, we will plow ahead. This is an important and exciting meeting for the Accountability Committee. And I want to begin by um, opening up for public comment. We set aside 20 minutes um, to hear from members of the public up to three minutes apiece. Um, do, Melinda, do we have anybody who would like to say words to the committee this morning? Uh, well, first what I'll do is I'll go ahead and open up the phone lines oh. to see if there's anyone on the phones. Um, and obviously if you're on the phone only, you won't be able to see what we're displaying, but you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. <clears throat> so if you can do that now. All right. I am not hearing anyone on the phones. Uh, and at this time, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, I'm just a, giving an extra few seconds to see if anybody shows up, but sounds like we're not going to have anybody join us this morning. And so then we will move on to uh, just reviewing the meeting summary from our December 14th meeting. Did anybody see any um, uh, needed edits to that? Folks have a chance to review it. I'm seeing some nods. Okay, so uh, then we will accept our meeting summary and move on to subcommittee reports. Rut, could I ask you to begin with a uh, update from the finance committee, subcommittee? Certainly. So our de December 16th meeting, we had a presentation by the Front Range Passenger Rail uh, Vice Chair David Riger and uh, David Singer from CDOT, who was uh, in charge of their project team. So after a background discussion and briefing on alternative routes, we talked about the initial stage financing that they need and uh, some of the challenges that they're facing there. We also talked about the potential applicability of that front range project to the to the outstanding RTD Northwest Rail Fast Tracks commitments. But uh, they said they will consider that, but they also said that that's something of a challenge. But it's it's one of the routes that they're looking at. Uh, so we also reviewed North Highland's work on the CARES Act funding, which we had asked them to go in and do an evaluation of. And the completed report is going to be is is included as an appendix to the RTDAC uh, preliminary report. We also evaluated to date their the RTD administrative overhead review that they're working on, and uh, we conclude there was progress on that, but it's really not ready for inclusion in the preliminary report. So uh, one of our goals will be finishing that. On our January 6th meeting, we received an in-depth presentation of the next round of COVID relief funding uh, from Ron Pastorf, Pastorf and, uh, and CEO Deborah Johnson. And we also uh, briefly discussed a preliminary report that we're about to talk about as it applies to the finance subcommittee. And we, we wrapped up with uh, some ideas uh, to discuss at our next meeting on post-COVID challenges to RTD's financial sustainability and ideas for overcoming the loss in ridership. So that's it for me. If anybody has questions, bye. Thank you, Rhett. Any questions for Rhett? Okay. So next we're gonna move on to the governance subcommittee. Is Julie with us?
I guess not. Um, so Doug, did you want to give a subcommittee update on the governance subcommittee? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but. Doug, are you there? Can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Doug is unmuted, but I think he's having issues still. So sorry, Doug, we're not able to hear you. Okay, why don't we, Doug, while you work on your um, audio, why don't we move to the third subcommittee? Can you hear now? Okay, now we can. And now we cannot. You hear me now? Nice, oh, now we can. <laughs> but now we cannot. Okay, Doug, um, we cannot hear you now. So why don't you keep working on that and I'll have Daya give her update on the operations subcommittee. And uh, hopefully mm -hmm. by then we'll have worked out the kink. So Daya, do you wanna move forward with your report? Sure, uh, thank you, Elise. Um, and I apologize, I am not on camera. I am still working through my technical issues on my personal camera, but I wanted to provide you all with an update from the operations committee. Um, at our previous meeting, we received an update both from General Manager Deborah Johnson as well as Jesse Carter on service delivery um, and uh, the CARES Act, similar to the Finance Committee, but really focusing in on uh, what's the current state of service delivery with RTD. Um, at that committee, we, we not only heard about what the projections might be um, around the CARES Act, but also just wanting to get a better sense of what um, the future might hold in terms of um, traffic count and folks returning into downtown. I think a few things that popped up from that committee um, are that we'd like some additional insight and information from um, business partners in the downtown area, but also other uh, anchor institutions to just get a better sense of what um, their commute is looking like for their employees. Um, at that meeting, we also discussed the a potential fair recommendation. One item that popped up from this committee is that we'd like to explore off-peak and peak um, fair structure with no transfers um, fees and then uh, essentially just simplifying both the past programs and the fair program. So um, we'll continue to develop this recommendation and at our next meeting we'll begin to shift over to service delivery um, while we continue to formulate what our um, overall recommendation is going to be. So if there aren't any other questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions for Daya? Okay, thanks so much Daya for that. Really appreciate it. So um, let's move back to the governance subcommittee and see if either Julie or Doug are able to give us a quick update. Doug, are you are you able to talk? Uh, so Elise, this is Melinda. Uh, Doug just logged back in. Um, we're giving him rights to speak right now. So we'll give him just a second. Okay, it looks like his audio is on. All right, Doug, if you wanna try and unmute yourself now. Hello. There we go. Hey, Doug. Oh, my word. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry, uh, technical issues today, obviously. Um, wow, no okay, I, I, I had to reboot three times, but I'm here. Um, I didn't know it was so easy to shut you up, Doug. I mean, we might have tried this earlier. <laughs> Touche. Hey, uh, so what am I talking about? Um, Julie is not here with us yet, um, and we were wondering if you oh, wanted to give a quick update on the governance subcommittee, just for our yeah. monthly reports. No, happy to do it. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and again, I apologize for the technical issues. Um, so at our last meeting, we, uh, we had a presentation from RTD um, kind of on service delivery as well as kind of their core system. We had a good conversation with staff on that. Um, I think we have true appreciation for, for, the, for the work that they do in that area. Um, and I think it even, it helped the committee, um, I know through our conversations, talk about you know, the whole concept of the whole um, um, local service council concept that um, 
it, it lent more credence to the idea of really investigating travel sheds um, in order to accommodate the uh, you know the the routes that we do have because the majority of routes within our region within the RTD uh, service area of course um, they traverse multiple counties so uh, Dr. Cox staff as well as uh, RTD staff are going to get together this week and, and initiate that conversation um, we also uh, we talked a little bit about the the um, the draft preliminary report that we're going to have a conversation about here in a little bit and that's about it Great, thanks for stepping in with that report. Any questions for Doug? Okay, with that, the last um, update we're getting is a, a brief RTD update. And um, Lynn, are you giving that or is there uh, somebody from RTD staff doing that? Good morning, this is Deborah Johnson. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Deborah, you're with us. Thank you. I am. I don't know what's going on with my camera as well, but I am here. <laughs> so, Wonderful. good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for the all of you this morning. Um, really quickly, once again, I know this has been covered in the subcommittee reports, but just wanted to share a little bit more information. Um, some of the issues in which RTD is currently contending, of course, we're awaiting information from the Federal Transit Administration as it relates to the apportionment for the stimulus uh, bill money, the new one that was effectuated into law December 27th. As you may be aware, uh, we have gone through um, position eliminations and some of those were filled positions quite naturally. I am anxious to see what those apportionments will be so I can make an informed decision about rescissions and how that translates into um, enhancing service delivery um, as we look going forward and ascertain what may be most suitable. Um, additionally, we are interested in what lies ahead as relates to vaccinations. Um, I am scheduling a meeting, or a meeting has been scheduled, I should say, with the Colorado, Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment so we can have discussions around uh, potentially transporting those in communities that probably would not have a means in which to get to a site to get a vaccination that's in the preliminary stages to see what kind of brainstorming we can do and outreaching uh, to those communities as well. Additionally, as we go forward, we are staying in tune and of course working with all of you to be as helpful as we can relative to recommendations being put forward. And um, with that being said, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, any questions for Deborah or additions? Lynn, were you wanting to add anything to that? No, I wasn't. I wasn't planning to, and I think uh, I think she covered kind of Got what's it. going on right now. Wonderful. Okay, with that, um, then we're done with updates, and we'll move to the action portion of the meeting. And I'll hand off to my able co-chair, Crystal. I would just note for the record that at this point we have all. RTD accountability committee members present, except for Chris Frampton and um, Julie. I have been in contact with Julie Malika um, via text, and she's having some kid issues, and she's going to try to uh, join us as soon as she can. So I'm here. Um, and just, what's that? Chris this is, is here. Chris, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, you're the black box on the screen. Awesome. <laughs> I just checked the attendees, and I didn't see you there. So Sorry, let Elise. the record stand corrected. Thanks so much for joining us. So. We're almost complete as a committee. So okay. let me hand off to Crystal to run the second half of the meeting. Thanks. Wonderful, and thank you for making that note as we um, head into action items for our, our discussion today. Um, we are slated to have a discussion on the uh, draft RTD Accountability Committee report. We had a preliminary report that we had um, voted to support, and I think uh, there may be a couple of potential changes that we'd like to discuss. And I have that um, Doug is going to be uh, communicating or sharing that part of the presentation and potentially other members of the Dr. Cog staff. So just wanted to hand the, the mic over for folks to get that conversation going. And hopefully no tech issues. <laughs> Great, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Can you hear me okay? Okay, cross yes. fingers here. Yeah, um, no, so thank you very much. And I don't know if Melinda's gonna, oh, there she is. She's able to pull it up. Um, 
Yeah, first I want to I want to thank um, obviously Dr. Cog's staff for helping to put this together. Um, the the look and the creative part of this, I really want to thank Dr. Cog's communications and creative staff. I think they did a tremendous job of of laying this out. Um, I would um, also uh, like to thank the the co-chairs and the and the chairs of the subcommittees for their participation, of course, in this as well. They had an uh, opportunity to review this prior to um, it, it going in the packet. So, um, so it's really in th in four different you know kind of sections. The first section is is the um, uh, is the introduction and the purpose of the committee, as outlined in the draft scope of work. Or sorry, it's not a draft anymore. The scope of work and um, and all that kind of good stuff. And then, Melinda, if you just scroll down a little bit, keep going. Just the membership. Table of contents. Keep going. Uh, there's the executive summary. This is the start of the you know kind of the introduction and the purpose. Keep going. The duties. Okay, right here. So um, the next section kind of lays out um, the priorities, the focus areas that the the committee had agreed upon for the for each of the subcommittees. So those are are laid out here um, within the report itself. And then Melinda, keep going. And then it kind of goes into each individual subcommittee and talks about you know some a summary basically of the activities of each subcommittee to date. And then uh, just click again, Melinda, one more time. Maybe one more time. Yeah, just one more. Oh, shoot, one more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having Melinda do it because my tech issues, I couldn't do it. And then, so it talks about kind of a summary of kind of month by month of the various topics that have been discussed and the presentations that have been received by each subcommittee. And then it, it has this, this table, each subcommittee has this table, which kind of outlines um, each of the focus areas that were represented on the previous pages, um, the work that has been done to date related to those focus areas, and then um, uh, potential areas for further investigation as we go forth over the next five months or so. Um, as, as you'll see in the governance one, there are a couple areas um, where you know we haven't had much conversation about yet. So and there's they're just basically had TBD in those. And so that's kind of the outline, uh, the outline for each of the subcommittees. Um, and then we get into the uh, the formal uh, legislative recommendations. And Melinda, if you want to scroll down to the to the recommendations. And as um, and as as the co-chair mentioned, yeah, this is an area. Keep going. It's it's towards the end. Um, this is an area where we did right here. So we we this is the area in which we have some some uh, revisions from what you saw last month, and quite frankly, is in re, in response to some conversations that have been had um, with with RTD as well as um, the drafters of the uh, possible legislation. So um, at this point. Uh, if it's okay, Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, I'd like to turn it over to the other co-chair, um, Commissioner Jones, just to walk you through some of those some of those revisions. Indeed. Thanks, Doug. Um, just to, by way of context, um, the committee had been given the option of uh, um, submitting an interim report uh, at the end of the year. We didn't have to. But one of the, the impetus behind doing so was to get these legislative recommendations in a timely fashion to the legislature so that they would have the opportunity to look at um, passing legislation that included them. So um, I want to start by um, giving a huge thank you to Rhett since he went through um, the RTD statutes. I did as well. We both came to very similar conclusions in, in doing our respective write-ups about where are there opportunities to adjust and amend some of the statutory directions given to RDD in order to provide more flexibility, um, it really in two areas, to improve the financial situation for RTD and to expand ridership, both to recover um, the uh, impacts the, uh, from the impacts that COVID has had on 
ridership as well as to look at expanding ridership uh, beyond pre-COVID levels. And there were um, four major areas in RTD statutes where um, it seemed to us that there were uh, undue restrictions that really hindered RTD's ability to be creative and move forward in making improvements in both the financial and ridership um, pieces of its operations. So um, we have been talking about these legislative changes, I think, since last November. There have been um, discussions in various subcommittees with, I think, um, uh, initial discussions with RTD board members. So none of this is new. Um, but it's worth uh, reviewing just to make sure we have it right. And in particular, um, I want to emphasize a couple points that none of these, these are not silver bullets. They will not magically make everything great for RTD, but they um, are um, important ways to create that flexibility I just spoke about. And uh, there, the four areas are fare box recovery, um, removing restrictions around what can happen on RTD property in terms of transit-oriented development and parking, restrictions on charging for parking, and then the ability to contract with other vehicular service providers. And uh, if, you, if we just want to quickly scroll through and remind people what they were um, on fareback's recovery, it was re removing the requirement that, um, that there be a 30% fare box recovery ratio um, in recognition that um, that might impede creativity around reducing fares, even going to free fares, doing pilots to increase, increase ridership using adjustments in fare box to improve equity, all of the above. So that, um, that first proposed edit is around removing that restriction. The second one was, again, the, the TOD um, opportunities on RTD's property, in particular moving what we saw as unnecessary restrictions around um, requiring a lot to, uh, more parking than perhaps is necessary. And um, there were some pretty constraining provisions around the RTD uh, uh, adjacent businesses and how they might be impacted. So um, that was removed. And then Number three is uh, removing the restrictions that exist now on RTD's ability to charge for parking. Obviously, there's a, if RTD charges a lot for parking at RTD at park and ride facilities, that could decrease ridership. So this is a this is an opportunity that would have to be used carefully. But if we remove the restrictions, then RTD has the ability to potentially raise some revenues but also to um, prioritize who gets to park, how long. Again, that was a, that's an opportunity to deal with equity um, and uh, create incentives for uh, uh, boosting ridership. And in this one, there's the, the change, one of the two changes is that have been made over the course of the development of the interim report that I wanted to shine a spotlight on this morning was that originally we were just deleting the whole um, the parking section of this statute. And in discussions with uh, legislative legal counsel at the Capitol, a question was, there's a number of other provisions in that section not directly related to charging for parking, for example, uh, what to do with abandoned vehicles and that kind of thing. And that maybe rather than delete wholesale, we might want to use a scalpel and just pull out the, the part that restricted RTD from charging for parking. And so we, um, instead of deleting wholesale, we included the proposed edit is that the committee recommends working with RTD and legislative legal services staff to refine this section to remove the limitations on RTD's ability to manage their parking facilities as opposed to putting the exact legislative um, uh, proposal in the interim report itself. So we're giving ourselves a little wiggle room to work with legal services to um, make sure we get the parking uh, section right and remove the restrictions, but leave in anything else that might be necessary. And then the fourth, the fourth legislative recommendation had to do with RTD's ability to contract with other transit service providers. Um, we had proposed, we, there are two proposed changes in the interim report. One that you've seen before is clarifying that RTD can, can contract directly with nonprofits and local governments in, in, in providing um, services. 
The second change, and this is a this is a change from the last time you saw the interim report, is the removal of the 58% cap on this. And we had originally talked about removing it, then we then we nixed that, and now after discussion discussions with RTD in particular, um, General Manager Deborah Johnson, we decided to to in, to include it again. Uh, and remove the 58% cap. And again, um, this is just to allow the flexibility, particularly with um, using uh, uh, creative, innovative um, opportunities like Uber and Lyft to deal with the first and final mile. Um, it should be noted that the, the RTD currently uh, provides or contracts with uh, bus, additional um, bus transit providers that are unionized, and that's something that we want to really take into account is that the importance of um, uh, worker protections. And uh, so we don't want to be at all anti-union, but the 58% cap does, we think, could provide a unnecessary limitation in the future as we look at providing for sort of non-traditional uh, mobility options, like I mentioned, Uber, Lyft, et cetera. So that's why this is back in there. and. Um, so I wanted to shine a spotlight on those two changes. Again, removing the 58% cap and just uh, uh, providing a little more flexibility in how we deal with removal of the restrictions on charging for parking. So that is the walk through the legislative proposals. Wanted to see if there's any questions about those changes um, because in particular, the two uh, modifications since the last time we discussed this. If there aren't any changes, then I'll, I'll, I'll return it back to you, co-chair, to, to facilitate um, actual adoption of the interim report. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, what does, I guess, one last call, and I'm, I'm scanning to see if there's anything in the chat as well for input, and I'm not seeing that either. Um, so, you know, we, we took a, a formal vote on the last set of recommendations. So I want to go ahead and um, open that up again uh, to get <laughs> on these next set of recommendations. So um, by either a vocal report or a show of hands, can I get um, a yay or nay on, on adopting this uh, amended set of legislative uh, report? Do we, should we have a formal motion and a vote since it's an actual report to the legislature and the governor? I don't know. I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at the Doug Rex box when I ask that question. Anybody? I too. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I move well, that I get a motion. I, I make a motion that we uh, vote on the acceptance of um, the recommended report in legislative changes. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second. Right, uh, with a motion and Jackie with a second. Um, Madam Chair, if, yes. If, if, I, if I may, just before, I just want to make sure we're clear on the motion. So the motion is not the, the I, I know what you meant, Rob, but I just want to make sure. You said the, the motion is to vote on, but the motion is to, to approve. approve or to adopt the report, right? Right. That, I accept that alteration. And that's okay with the second? Yes. Okay, I'm getting a head nod and we will open the floor for a yay or nay. Um, oh, I guess all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Alrighty, sounds like there's a unanimous um, agreement in adopting those um, legislative changes. That wraps up yay. our yeah, yay. Congrats, everyone. <laughs> um, wraps up our action items. Uh, let's transition to the briefing on the CARES Act spending. Uh, Matthew, uh, take it away. Good morning. Crystal, uh, Matthew uh, Helfand. Uh, uh, Crystal, before, I just want to say a huge thank you to uh, Crystal, I'm sorry, I'm not, the co-chairs, 
and the chairs of the subcommittee, um, uh, Rutt and, and Dea and Julie, uh, in addition to the Dr. Cog staff, you guys did a tremendous amount of work, uh, particularly over the holidays. And I just want to let you know on behalf of myself and the committee, it's greatly, your efforts are greatly appreciated. This is a very good document and thank you. If I might just add on to that, yeah, we moved through this pretty quickly. I, I was expecting more discussion and hats off to Dr. Cogstaff for really putting this all together. And I already thanked Rudd, but I want to thank him again, you know, that really doing some heavy lifting on the legislative stuff, which is really, really key. So thanks to all, but particularly those folks. Same, oh, same wait, here. And oh, the sorry. equity assessment, which was we 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 talked about before, which is pretty groundbreaking and very thorough and and um want to thank the folks involved with that because that was that that's really a key piece of this as well uh, i just want to echo uh echo the thanks as well but also a question on the timing so when will this sort of formally be issued and and how how will that happen this interim report i assume it goes on the dr cog web page but how else are we getting this out Madam, Madam Co-Chair, this is Doug. Um, well, I was actually going to contact the co-chairs after this and see exactly how we wanted to transmit this. I would suggest that it probably should, the email probably should come from one of them to um, to the, the partners in the creation of the RTD Accountability Committee. So um, so stay tuned, but it will be going out here in the next, next day or so. And just to clarify, it's going to it's going to RTD, it's going to um, the two transportation committee chairs, and it's going to the governor's office. Correct. Uh, is it possible to share um, the this draft with um, Metro Mayor's Caucus? Is going to be having a meeting, a trans, starting our transportation committee meetings, and I think this is a document that they would support. Is it is it possible to share it? Uh, can you let us know when we can share it with other entities that we're engaged with to um, uh, encourage, I guess, widespread uh, support and, and inclusion and discussion? So what's the what's the body's thinking on that? It, it seems to me that this is this should be a publicly accessible document. I mean, if this committee is, has gone through this whole process and approved it, it should be available uh, for, for consumption by anyone. Although the, the initial move should be, of course, to the governor and the legislature and RTD. Yes. It, it, that, it really needs to be available to anyone. And it is, right? So this is a public meeting. This is in our um, our packet. But to Jackie's point, I think there's a, a bit, and we've had conversations with our leadership on this. There's a difference between saying that we have a good process, right? Especially when we're referring to public comment, we, have, we had a really robust conversation of the value of that. Um, and there's one thing, it's one thing to have a good process and to have something publicly available as opposed to um, proactively kind of sharing that with our networks. And I, I would agree, Jackie, that that would be really helpful and that we would lean on the committee to help uh, circulate that um, as needed. Cause you know, as you know, we haven't had much public comment. So, you know, I, I think it could help kind of maybe stimulate some conversations early on um, with, with other stakeholder groups. And we, you know, I know we've tried our best um, in the short time frame to do that as well. But I, I think the more input, uh, the better, especially when we're trying to think of solutions that people really are, are hopeful that um, will we'll adopt and will be helpful long-term. So um, that, I mean, that's just, I think, a recap of conversations we've had um, from our leadership uh, meetings, but, I don't know, does anyone else have any thoughts? Um, should we make it a formal process? Uh, Kathy? I was thinking that, I don't know what formal process means, but we could certainly do a uh, press release as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. That is a great yes. idea, yeah. And it may be appropriate for there to be some kind of a cover letter from the two co-chairs uh, and perhaps Doug Rex as well. And so they've played such a big role in this. But I, I think just sending it out yeah. just as it is, uh, it, naked is kind of, I don't know if that's the best way. I think that's a great idea, right? Not to create more work for Dr. Cog or uh, Elise or Crystal, but I do think uh, I do think a letter transmitting it uh, to the to Senator Winner and Representative Gray and, and Governor Polis makes some good sense. Um, 
on behalf of the body. And I would love, I guess, uh, uh, selfishly, uh, I've got a transportation Metro mayor's meeting tomorrow, planning meeting tomorrow morning. I'd love to be able to share just the findings, the recommendations that, that are moving forward, but I don't want to do that if it's conflicting with what uh, plans are for, for this group. So, Doug, so is it possible today? To... Well, we have adopted it in a public meeting, so it yeah. is it is available, I think, for you to talk about, but it, ideally we would formally get this out today if we could, um, okay. I don't know, Doug, if it's possible to work together with you to get that um, sort of cover letter, which which I assume would also be the body of the email that we would use to to, de, to deliver this to the governor and the, the legislature and RTD. Yep. I think that would be great. And the idea of a press release, Kathy, that's a great idea. Um, maybe once we get, you know, send it out that we can also do press around it and send it out on social media so people know that we're taking action. I don't know if it was mentioned that um, Crystal and I will be presenting to the RTD board on January 26th and to the um, Transportation Committee on January 27th. I think I have those dates right? Yep. So we are trying to get the word out, but um, no need to stop just there. But you you mentioned to the legislature and to the governor, but I, <clears throat> I think in the spirit of cooperation, there should be a CC that's real clear on that to the CEO of RTD as well. I think it's not a CC. I think it's also going directly to RTD because RTD has a formal role in this as well. So okay. a big catch if we didn't mention that. Lynn, did you want to add something? Uh, just that, that uh, someone just texted me. We can certainly post it on the RTD website and uh, um, you know help with the, the press release and all of those things. I think um, from a conversation last week that the process, that in terms of the legislative piece, that um, uh, Representative Gray and Senator Winter will be um, co-sponsors and. Um, it won't go in this week, it won't be submitted this week when they gavel in for three days and then gavel out. I think they're expecting to come back February 16th or around there and it would be um, a late bill submitted at that time, which is good because uh, the, the RTD board has seen this several times, but it will be nice to have uh, the co-chairs come and meet on the 26th and uh, um, answer any questions we have at that point. Thanks. And Doug, could I also suggest, and I don't know if it has to be the co-chairs, but I think it'd be ideal if it could, does a presentation for the Dr. Cog board as well. And then we'll probably invite you to Metro Mayor's um, or at least the Metro Mayor's Transportation Committee. I just think uh, getting as many folks with eyes on it to Crystal's point and, and really being um, thoughtful about pushing it out there is to the benefit of the work we're doing and to the engagement process, and I think to providing a, a, a better document, um, a, a better a better uh, product at the end. Excuse me. So uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the Dr. Cog schedule looks like, but I do think it makes good sense at a work session potentially to have this information available. Yeah, Mayor. Just so you know, I have planned on putting it in um, the board agenda packet, which goes out this Wednesday. Putting it in as an information item, um, the the report, and we can do a briefing. Oh, once I can get on either Crystal or Lisa's uh, calendars. I was sure I had attended my last Dr. Cog board ah, meeting. That's just what you Dang. thought. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I'm wondering, do we need to, uh, I guess, memorialize these this conversation in any way for the packets or just for the committee's information? I think it might be helpful to refer to, you know, for a fact, we have shared this with XYZ stakeholder groups, um, just for our, our processes and, and transparency. Okay. Yeah, this is some great conversation. Crystal, something else I want to jump in and add, if I can. Um, so one of the other things that I, I just want to clarify, I'm assuming and I think I, I saw at the end there's a, a, an email address or something. So for like example, if stakeholders want to have comments on this report or want to weigh in, um, obviously outside of our regular um, public invited to be heard um, period of time, they could reach out to Dr. Cog's staff um, and reach out to the committee to provide you know their input. Since I'm hoping that you know we can press this out to all of our stakeholders and then they could come back um, 
if they do have further questions, clarifying questions, or, or other issues that they want to address. So I just wanted to make sure that that was said on this call. Go ahead, Elise. I just wanted to add that as we um, send the interim report out, that we're the only active recommendations in it are the legislative ones. And so we're handing it off to the state legislature, which we have no control over. So these are our best ideas, our recommendations. We hope they take them and run with them. But that really kicks off a public process in the legislature. And we're basically handing it over to the transportation committee chairs to run that. And um, we can try to influence that process, but it, it's no longer our process. But there's a, a, an active public component to that that we should remind people that they should engage with um, if they want that bill passed, or if, if they want to lobby for amendments or whatever, um, that will be the opportunity there. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, once it goes through that process, um, I, I would imagine that Elise and I um, may be asked to speak, um, but of course, any anything that we do, we would keep you all um, updated and informed on, on kind of how we are also disseminating and representing the larger group. So just as we know, things move quickly. Uh, okay, any last thoughts on um, sharing this proposal out? I would mention that, uh, that, that there's, in addition to having the CARES Act review spending, spending review in the report, uh, it's also in our minutes, and I assume we're not going to wind up with two copies of it going out. It seems to be also an object, uh, item for discussion in our agenda today, which I think we've already kind of covered. But uh, oh, are you mean? Are you referring to like our, our a meeting, the meeting summary, or that it lives in two places in this backup? It, it lives in two places in the packet. Okay. I have a video. Yeah, and you're just saying that we just have one, it just ends up being the for same sure. report. <laughs> for sure. Okay, just wanted to clarify your comments. Thanks, Rhett. Alrighty, um, I think we're good to move on to our informational briefing um, on the CARES Act spending review. Matt, are you good to go? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Okay. Thank you, Madam and Chair. Ron, uh, Matthew. Oh, sorry about that, Ron. Were you wanting to jump in real quick? If Madam Co-Chair, if you don't mind, um, I'll preempt Matthew just a little bit because we have breaking news from our partners at the Federal Transit Administration who just released the apportionment tables for the most recent COVID relief funding um, that this topic is relevant to. So I just wanted the committee to have that information prior to the conversation about this because the conversation about sort of the CARES Act uh, funding review may have some implications for the committee's continued conversations about any recommendations that you may want to make to RTD about use of the more recent COVID relief funding. So the apportion, according to the apportionment table released this morning from FTA, um, uh, the Denver Aurora metro area RTD will receive uh, $190.9 million. So I just wanted, to, wanted the committee oh. to be aware of that information before uh, Matthew and the North Island team launches off. Thank you. Ron, real quick, was that in the, I, I know you had given us a range of um, dollars that could be sent. Can you remind us what that range was? And my, we my, my initial estimate was um, quite a bit more conservative. Um, I kind of had estimated about 130 to $139 million. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you for being, Oops, I muted myself. <laughs> Thank you for your conservative estimation to kind of level our expectations. I think that's really great news um, that we exceeded that. All right, Matt, I think for the third time, it's third time's a charm. <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. Matthew Helfant, uh, Senior Transportation Planner, Dr. Cog. Um, uh, as all of you know, uh, the uh, the CARES Act was passed by Congress uh, back in March, uh, and uh, 25 uh, uh, the package included 25 billion in uh, direct relief for transit agencies, and of that, 232 million approximately uh, went to RTD. Um, at the uh, December 14th meeting, 
uh, the um, RTD accountability consultant, North Highland, provided an overview. Um, based on that overview uh, and based on um, the input that uh, was received, uh, North Highland, the North Highland team has uh, made some small revisions to the report. It's included in your packet. And um, at this time, uh, especially given the uh, small amount of time left, I'd like to just turn it over to uh, the um, North Highland team to see if they have any comments and then open up uh, for discussion uh, amongst the committee. Thank you, Matthew. Can can y'all hear me? Yeah. Hi, Tanya Eidelman with North Highland. I um, want to thank you all for the great feedback you provided to us. Um, so some changes, as, as Matthew mentioned, there were a few minor changes, so I just want to highlight those. And um, one bit of feedback we received is that it was very important that this report come from the RTD committee. So we did make some um, adjustments and changes to the overall layout and appearance, uh, making sure that um, you know RTD was highlighted um, and that this committee was highlighted as opposed to you know the partnership with Dr. Cog, which was the sort of the initial um, feel of the document. So we did make those changes as well. Um, and then we did provide a one-page executive summary, understanding uh, legislatures aren't always crazy about even a, a five to ten page document. So there has been an executive uh, summary added to that document. Um, and then the inclusion of links to the documents that were um, used for this analysis, um, which are all on the RTD library. So there are active links in that document now, so you can pull directly the information um, that, was, that was given. Um, I think that is high level what, what, was, um, what was done. I think findings remain the same. There were no changes there. Um, but just, just a few tweaks to make sure that this uh, report is coming directly from um, the RTD Accountability Committee. I'll pause there and see if there are any questions or if uh, Anna wants to add anything further. I do not have anything else to add, no, thank you. Great. Are there any questions? Do you, do you have a, do we have time, chairs, to just be reminded of the major findings in this report? Yes, we go until 10 a.m., so we, we do have some time. Great. So, yeah, I'd be happy to share those with you. Um, really, there were three major findings within this report, and, um, you know, that was that, um, you know, RTD did spend the money, as was intended by the FTA. Um, you know, there, there's no irregularities or anything unusual found there. We also noted that RTD um, really worked hard to balance the provision of transportation services along with the responsibility to its workforce and the region's economic stability. So, you know, at the time um, the funding was, was given, um, you know, it was very unclear how long COVID would last. So it didn't make a lot of sense to make drastic changes at that time. Um, and in addition, RTD implemented some other cost-cutting measures um, that included some changes to service. Um, as you know, they also made some adjustments more recently um, to, to headcount and, and things of the like. So, um, you know, they, they worked uh, to find other cost-cutting measures that could, you know, maintain service, um, but at the same time, um, making sure that, that um, you know, they were, they were trying to keep on as many folks of the workforce as possible um, in the hopes that service would return to normal um, at, at some given point. So those are, are the three high-level findings of, of that analysis. Could I ask a follow-up on that? Um, Certainly. Were any of the, and in reading the report, uh, were any of the cost-cutting measures that were enacted things that can be ongoing expense reductions, or, or, or would, could you give us just a broad, like, Half of the things they did are things that will continue to provide cost cutting, uh, co you know, cost reduction benefits or once they get post COVID, it's all going back in again. Um, well, let me pause and let me just say some of those additional cost cutting measures and then maybe adjust, uh, address the question per cost cutting measure. So one one of the um, items that RTD implemented was um, you know, trying to expedite required training. So training that's required by the FTA, FTA for example, 
um, and maintaining certifications. So if you didn't need someone running a train um, because service has been reduced, you know, go, go ahead and get those certification trainings managed in advance. Um, so they did things like that. Uh, there's only there's only a limited opportunity to do those sorts of things, right? Because you know that those certifications are renewed, you know, depending on the certification, um, you know, on an annual or biannual basis. So that's something they can continue to look forward, you know, look looking at doing in the future, but not it's not going to be a major cost cutting um, effort for them to pursue once uh, service returns to normal. Um, you know, in terms of salary cuts and furloughs. Um, those are a couple of other cost cutting measures that were implemented. And again, I think in terms of, you know, long term, um, is that something you can continue to do, um, you know, post COVID? Um, most, most likely not. You're going to, um, you know, really run into issues of maintaining talent and, and recruitment problems if you cannot pay, you know, a, a, a wage that's, um, you know, on par with what other agencies or other um, entities within the region are paying. One of the things that they may be able to do post COVID is um, something something interesting they did where they sort of redeployed frontline employees from regular job responsibilities. Um, so, for example, um, there are Treasury employees whose job it is to um, you know count money, um, and so they redeployed those folks to do more cleaning and sanitation work. Um, so that's a specific example, and while that, that is something they might not be able to do long term, um, eventually somebody is going to have to count the cash as it comes in. But, um, you know, is, is that something that RTD can do more of or find more opportunities? I think that there, there may be other opportunities like that, that that could exist in the future. One of the things I'll jump in, um, Tanya, to say one of the other things that we noted is that they put in place um, a hiring freeze. Uh, which is certainly what most entities do in times like this, right? There is um, uncertainty and um, concern and we need to cut the budget quickly, so hiring freeze. Um, we would also expect that um, to the extent that RTD moves forward from their current state, that they'll need to invest a bit to figure out where cuts actually should happen um, and not let sort of the organic hiring freeze um, be the way and reason that that cuts in effect in effect happen. Um, and I say that from having been, you know, in government um, during difficult times, it is a very natural thing to say hiring freeze and then 15% across the board, right? Most governmental entities do that when there is a budget concern. And, and that doesn't get to um, the most um, um, logical um, or thoughtful ways of, of having um, staff deployed. So, um, so certainly it was the right um, and, and immediate way to um, get dollars off the books um, and to the extent that there are longer term changes in service, they'll need to actually review and, and be able to be thoughtful about that. Madam Chair, may I make a comment or an observation? I, I think uh, in, in answer to Jackie's uh, comments, I think there will likely have to be some reductions in service, and uh, particularly in areas where the ridership was just extremely low and where the subsidies are extremely high. And so part of the balance of what we're going to have to figure out as a committee in terms of our ongoing recommendations is what is the what are the right answers to service area size, what are the right answers in, in terms of, of how you balance driving ridership? Uh, you know, we talk about that, but at the same time, RTD has to have a balanced budget. And, uh, and so in, in terms of free fares and all the things that we want to do there on a pilot basis or whatever, we, we have to get back to a ridership level that justifies the existence of RTD. And right now we're just down so far from what the normal ridership is. So uh, I, I do think that there will have to be some changes that are that are long-term changes in in terms of uh, how that spending structure. That's part of what uh, we have a responsibility as a committee to try to 
come up with equitable recommendations. Ultimately, it is up to RTD whether they accept those recommendations or not. And I guess, Rudd, to me, I was looking beyond just service cuts. Uh, I think the city of Lone Tree is experiencing its own budget challenges right now with 30% reduction in revenue. And one of the challenges that I've given to our team is we are doing things differently, doing more with less, and are there parts of what we're doing now that make good sense to continue on into the, into the future? Have we identified efficiencies uh, that we can carry forward and, and reduce our costs long term. And I guess, you know, never, never fail to take advantage of a good crisis, uh, Winston Churchill, right? So I guess that was my question. Uh, have they identified things and practices, best practices that they can take forward in reducing the overhead costs associated with the operation of the system, not just cutting service? Great, it was a great question and as always. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a serious question for the rest yeah. of you. This is Daya. I, I have a comment and a, I guess a question. Um, I just wanna circle back around on, I think a comment that Rebecca made, I believe at a finance subcommittee meeting. And really the issue when it came to um, the CARES Act funding was was at least from the public perception a little bit of question around transparency and so I'm just kind of wondering as we start to um, uh, think about our recommendation with this breaking news that um, that Ron and the Dr. Cog team shared with us how can we use that and how can we use what we have um, determined as a committee um, to move forward with a recommendation that enables RTD to provide some level of transparency with this next apportionment of dollars um, so I guess that's a comment. And then I, I, a question that I have is around workforce. And you know, I acknowledge that RTD, much like several transit agencies across the country, is in a position where um, you know it's making some really difficult choices in terms of its workforce. But I'm wondering if we could use this as an opportunity to either build um, some sort of uh, apprenticeship type programs to build that pipeline of workers um, as we start to look to, to Rutt's recommendation and, and Rutt's suggestion of bringing in um, more writers. I mean, we're, we're going to have, we were already were experiencing a workforce shortage. So I'm just wondering like what, what can we as a committee start to offer um, in terms of those recommendations? I did just want to, to, to build on what Daya said, and thank you for bringing that up because that's exactly what I was going to mention. You know, I think um, we talked about the value of, of having North Highland do this report was that it would help inform RTD's future use of the, the second allocation of CARES. And, and I would love to see just more transparency and more of a, um, not so much even a public process, but um, discussion with the board that you could sort of follow along with the priorities that RTD is using to to allocate these dollars. Um, I don't know if it's possible to put that in this report um, since that wasn't something that came up from North Highland, but I do feel pretty strongly that that would be of great value as RTD moves forward. And the Finance Committee has has discussed and and looked at, at what uh, CDOT, for example, is using in terms of online disclosure of financial information. I think that ultimately is going to be one of the recommendations that that the committee should seriously entertain because there needs to be that kind of visibility. I think CDOT's was a little more elaborate perhaps than we could that we wouldn't want to just say, go do what CDOT's doing, because it, it really requires a lot of maintenance and a lot of input. So I think there's a sort of a lighter version of that that might be appropriate long-term uh, for us to recommend as a committee. Well, even just understanding what the priorities the board is using to make these decisions. I mean, just having exactly. that, that framework would, I think, be very helpful for the public. And part of that's winning back the, the support and that that uh, enthusiasm for mass transit in the public that has, you know, with the cuts that we've had to make, it's it's dwindled, and uh, we need to we need to get that support back if we're ever going to gain any additional funding. 
other than just you know increases in sales tax as the economy recovers? Any other comments? Go ahead, Lynn, you're muted. Lynn, you're muted. We're still not able to hear you for whatever reason. Maybe you could post something in the chat. I swear it's nothing we've done, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I heard you. I heard you laugh. Didn't I? No. That might have been mine. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that, Lynn. Uh, yeah, we are having a myriad of technical issues. Elise, did you have a comment? Yeah, just um, looking forward to the second tranche of CARES Act funding to RTD. Um, I'm just thinking of the timing for this committee to provide any recommendations that we might have to RTD on how they might yeah. spend that. Um, recognizing that the next sort of required or directed um, document from this comp committee isn't until we finalize an end in July and the mon monies will be spent before then. Just thinking that we may need to um, decide that we want another interim report or interim communication RGD specific to um, the second tranche that happens in the next couple of months rather than waiting to July. So I just wanted to throw that out to the committee as it's something we should think about doing. I, I would totally agree with that. And, you know, maybe it can be a little less formal in terms of a letter from the committee. Um, but I feel like we've got a narrow window here to provide some input. And I'm getting, oh, sorry. Oh, did you want to follow up? I just want, I assume that, that Rutt's subcommittee will be the place that, that sort of drives that initial discussion, but maybe not. I mean, I think there's other committees, subcommittee involvement, but maybe if Rutt can be put in charge and that, that that's something that we need to get th through by the end of February, I would I would guess. You know, I, I do I, I do want to say that I, would, I hope that the subcommittee chairs will also be a big participant in that process and be able to bring those ideas and add their own ideas to it uh, and bring it back to their committees. I, I'm, I'd love to, Mary, very happy to take a lead on it, but I, I really think it has to come from all of us. Well, and, and even as I say that, I'm thinking, I'm looking at Kathy Nesbitt's my box on my screen going, a lot of this has to do with worker retention and rehiring and retraining and, and that kind of thing. So we'll want to tap into her expertise and the operations committee as well. So you're right. Excuse me, this is Deborah Johnson. Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, I too am having technical difficulties and just wanted to clarify a couple of points that was made earlier, if I may. When we talked about a hiring freeze, I wanna be clear that everybody understands that there's some caveats associated with that hiring freeze. We would not sacrifice the safety of our system if in fact we need to have certain positions hired. So there is, some caveats attributed to that. I just want everybody to be aware. And then also appreciate um, the committee's interest in providing us with guidance as relates to that. Um, as we look at the bill text, as we all know, is specific toward um, retaining labor to deliver service. I'd be remiss not to say when we talk about frontline employees, operators, and mechanics, they could not function if in fact you didn't have the management aspect of that as well. So taking that all into account, we'll be looking holistically at, are there other positions that don't fall within the ranks of frontline unionized positions that are imperative for the overall betterment of the system? And perhaps that's more aligned and focused on a decrease, a de decreasing the number of furlough days that salaried employees have to take, because not only are salary employees looking at a 7.5% pay cut, there's also furlough days attributed to that. And in, in having discussions with employees, there are concerns and angst around we have sort of a disparate focal point as relates to the employees as a whole. So I just wanted that to be made apparent to all of you all as I look to meet with my teams today and help to assuage, you know, fears as relates to what's coming because while we got money, uh, well, we didn't get money today, while the apportionment tables have been made available today, 
we still have to go down this path to discern what does that mean in reference to the overall service delivery model and will there be other forthcoming money because for all intents and purposes this is more or less kicking the can down the, down the street but we don't know what tomorrow brings as it relates to the overall funding shortfall this agency has for our, 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 our budgetary year of 2021. So thank you very much for listening to that. Thank you, uh, Deborah. That, that input's really critical uh, for us to hear and just for the public to have greater context. So thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so that um, is our segue into uh, administrative items. Um, I will just go ahead and just jump right into that. Um, Elise's comments um, asking uh, Kathy for some guidance on, on that particular topic is actually a really good segue. Um, so um, just for the, the public and for the committee uh, uh, knowledge, we, we wanted to share an update on, on the uh, structure and kind of the position uh, that Ms. Kathy Nesbitt um, fulfills as an HR professional. Um, so, you know, we we have certain um, roles that were slated for this committee um, with certain expertise and, you know, in thinking about the most effective way, um, effective and efficient, frankly, way to move forward in, in, in utilizing some of that expertise, we wanted to just share that, um, uh, Kathy's position as the HR professional is going to be more of a um, ad hoc on call um, committee representative. Um, so really what that means is uh, Kathy will have less of a, uh, a presence in the subcommittees. Um, I, I believe she's going to prioritize these full committee meeting conversations. Um, but uh, when needed, um, we're going to call on her advice and expertise to help, you know, advise on HR issues and, you know, HR can be really broad, but, um, you know, the, the onus is going to be on, on, on the co-chairs, myself, Elise, and our subcommittee co-chairs as we enter into discussions, um, future discussions until, you know, the, the wrapping up of our committee to um, really plan out that work so that we can give um, notice and incorporate um, that position and Kathy specifically in that role um, for her feedback and input. So we wanted to just apprise you all of that change. There, there, you, know, you may notice a bit of a decrease in her attending just, just because we've changed the, the structure um, in consultation with her to, to figure out the best way to you know, make this more efficient and effective um, for that particular position. So wanted to make everyone aware of that. Uh, Kathy, I don't know if you want to add a couple words um, on the matter. Um, sure. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for that consideration. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I have had conversations with uh, the chairs and, and others on the committee just in regards to um, my support and expertise. And up until now, we haven't used a whole lot of it in terms of HR. Um, and so um, I just asked a question as to um, whether or not it would be best if I were on call so as to um, make sure that um, I am adding value and it's time well spent for me. And so I really like the idea of me engaging um, certainly where if I feel like I can add input and um, expertise. So um, I certainly will be looking at all of the agendas to make sure that I'm staying abreast of what's happening. But specifically, um, my, my participation will be um, limited to those areas where um, there is going to be some discuss, discussion regarding um, HR expertise. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, I am honored to continue to serve in that capacity. Kathy, we're excited to, to keep you on board and to make most use of um, what you have to offer the committee. So I'm glad we were able to work something out um, there. And, you know, thanks to my co-chair for helping lead some of that, um, you know, really important conversation, back-end conversations to make sure we could um, make this a feasible commitment and really a meaningful one. Um, I think that is uh, important for all of our committee members to feel that, that we are accomplishing both of those. So um, thank you um, to, to my co-chair on that. Um, that is the 
biggest I, the update I have on my end, um, I will chime our tag team, um, my co-chair Lisa, see if she also wanted to comment on any of that process or otherwise. I think you covered that very well. So no more to add there, but I guess the other big sort of administrative item is now that we've finalized our interim report, congratulations again for that. Now we really are looking forward to the second half of the committee's work and recognizing a quick look at the calendar that we really only have you know, a little over five months left before we have to go through the process of submitting a final report. And if you back away from that and you're like, wow, that's not much time to get through all of the other recommendations we have around RTD and we are only really scratching the surface and so that just sort of heightened awareness on the part of the uh, co-chairs and and Dr. Cog staff and subcommittee chairs on we really need to have a detailed schedule of of our remaining time left what um, areas the subcommittees are going to cover in terms of what are we writing recommendations on and when and so that everybody um, on this committee and in the public have a sense of exactly where we're going, that we're gonna be writing recommendations in these, you know, for example, seven areas and tune in in March if you wanna work on this, you know, this piece of it. So um, over the next hopeful, hopefully week or so, um, we'll be working with the different subcommittees. There will be a, a conversation in each of the subcommittees about, okay, let's get super detailed and specific and put it on a timeline what we're gonna be tackling. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that um, any of the um, remaining ideas that you were thinking that we would get to, whatever, now it's it's time to to really um, hone in, focus, prioritize, because there's a gazillion, we have sort of sky's the limit in terms of what we can look at, and we, we really need to focus in on those couple handfuls of things that really are the most important and that we'll have time to get through. So just wanted to flag that as, as something that's coming down the pike in the next week or two. Thank you, Elise. That is uh, definitely integral and connected to, um, you know, us moving forward. So, you know, I think we are hoping to have that, um, like you said, uh, established rather quickly, and then that would be available for uh, public consumption and just uh, transparency on our end. Um, we were also earlier talking about stakeholder engagement, workshopping this with our respective organizations, and that perhaps would give a little bit more of a targeted focus in those conversations um, if we're able to kind of uh, out outline some of those topics more um clearly um and although they do exist in the body of our document now i think just that would be a helpful tool so yeah we look forward to um those conversations offline uh to get that um pulled together any other member comments I was, just, I was just going to add, I, I think it'd be helpful as we do that to return to those sort of um, guidance principles, or um, what am I trying to say? At least you had worked on it beginning, I think, with, with Crystal and sort of what we want each committee to try to achieve. And that'd be a good document to return to and, and um, determine where we are and sort of meeting those objectives and what is what remains, because I thought that was a really helpful summary of, of what our priorities were. Good point. I'll recirculate that to the subcommittee chairs just to put that uh, on the top of the email pile, refresh people's memories. I would I would also add that we have um, several new members of the RTD board that um, are joining, sort of will get to know us um, midstream. And when Crystal and I um, make our presentation to the full RTD board, we'll have an opportunity to sort of bring them up to speed. But we may end up having additional conversations as needed with with some of them as well, or you you all can, um, just so they feel like they're they're um, in the loop. Alrighty, any other comments? Yes, Doug, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Um, just a note to the to the governance subcommittee members. Um, the, uh, our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, which is Martin Luther King Day. Our offices are closed. So I'm gonna uh, poll our committee, our subcommittee to look for alternate dates um, associated with that. Just, 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 just an FYI that we'll be getting an email out to you guys later today to look for some uh, additional dates. Thank you.
All right, I'm not seeing any other comments uh, from the committees or any other business we need to address. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining us. Happy New Year and happy MLK Day um, in the next week or so. So thank you all um, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.